So this is going to be a rant about how the so-called Unix tradition, the system of a hierarchy of processes and file permissions and all that sort of stuff uh, that comes down to us from the original Unix, all that stuff really needs to be scrapped. It's well past time that we effectively entirely replace the Unix user land. Not really the kernel, that's all fine. We can keep most of, like, say, the Linux kernel. Um, but some of it will have to be changed to present a different kind of abstraction for user land. And before going into details, I should be clear, um, I'm picking on Unix uh, here specifically, but uh, Windows and other alternatives have all sorts of their own similar problems. They just made uh, different variants of the same mistakes. I should also say this is part of a, a larger rant about just general software quality and why it's so hard to make good software these days. I think one of the very major reasons is because we're building on top of really shoddy platforms, and that goes for Unix, but it also goes for Windows and basically everything else, whether you're talking about the web as a platform. It's really unfortunate that we, where we are today because everything is this huge kludge, it's this huge giant mess where, yes, of course, there are very good reasons, economical and, and some technical, of why we don't just scrap the whole thing, why these things have hobbled along for so long, and why the, the path forward usually taken is to just pile more stuff on top. Certainly at each step along the way, there are very good reasons why that has been done. But you add that up over the decades, and what we get is a bigger and bigger mess. And that's what all these platforms, Unix included, feel like. They feel like this giant mess where it's like a work area, it's like a desk, where you have all your stuff piled up, and you don't want anyone to touch it because, hey, you know where everything is. But all this mess has accreted over decades now, and you, the person who owns the desk, or in the analogy, the community of people keeping track of this mess, you know where everything is, you're comfortable with this giant mess, and it would actually be a huge burden to you if, if it were to be scrapped and uh, replaced with something much more sane. And that's unfortunately where we are, is that Unix and other platforms are these giant messes where uh, the people in charge, the people doing the actual work, like uh, maintaining Linux kernel and maintaining Unix user land, uh, they're all comfortable with this giant mess, but it's extremely inhospitable to newcomers, and it creates all sorts of burdens for people who uh, aren't experts in the whole giant mess, but have to uh, work with it tangentially, you know, have to deal with some parts of it, as, as you do if, say, you're building user software, or actually if you're just a, a regular user in many cases. What the general programmer experience feels like these days, and in fact, uh, in many cases, the general user experience feels like, is that all but the simplest pieces of software are, are all rat holes unto themselves, where, you know, something doesn't act like you expect it to, and figuring out how to fix it uh, is this giant tangent that leads you on to 20 other tangents. And those 20 other tangents probably each have their own 20 other tangents. That's what the modern user experience is often like for at least power users. And it's what the programming experience is almost always like. Even just the act of building software and keeping track of your, uh, your code with version control. Um, all of those tools are, have gotten so complex, the build tools and the version control system uh, tools have gotten so complex, I think in many cases because the underlying platforms are abstracting over have also gotten really complex. And if that underlying platform were simpler, then this wouldn't filter up to the software above it. So what's so bad about Unix? Well, first off, almost anything to do with terminals and shells. Uh, I should qualify that right off the bat by saying clearly the idea of a programmatic user environment where you have complete control programmatically over the system, that's totally sound. But everything from there about terminals and shells is really a disaster. And it doesn't have to be this way. The core problem here is just the sheer complexity of the whole arrangement. Sure, in the simple case of, hey, you bring up the terminal, you have a shell there, and you type commands and it does what the command says. It, it seems really simple for the, the trivial cases, but what we end up dealing with inevitably in any complex system is all the edge cases. When anything goes wrong, the whole complexity of the thing tends to rear its head and it's this huge drain on all your time and your attention. Just think of all the moving pieces and the conceptual complexity involved with a very simple command, like say, uh, ls hyphen la uh, redirected to foo. To really understand what's going on here, you have to know like 15 different things. So first off, there's this terminal thing, which is like the pseudo device in the Linux kernel. So it's like a pseudo hardware device that is uh, interacting with this shell process. Text typed at the terminal gets to the shell process. It looks at that command and interprets it as invoking the LS program, which should be on your path, right? Otherwise it won't know where to find it. And what the fuck is the path? Well, it's this environment variable thing which has to do with process hierarchies of uh, data 
handed down from processes spawning other processes. And so anyway, the path variable uh, lists a bunch of directories where uh, ls should be found in one of those. And so the shell process forks itself and execs ls in the fork. Uh, the text hyphen la, that's passed into the uh, parameters of the first function by C conventions, passed into the, the char array there, char pointer array, I should say. And so what hyphen la means is entirely up to this particular program, which we're invoking the ls program. The angle bracket foo, however, that's totally different. That's something the shell itself recognizes as part of its syntax. And so it says, okay, this, before I fork an exec uh, to run the ls program, I need to open this file foo in the current working directory, which, which is a part of the shell processes state. We're gonna open up that file for writing. And in the fork where we're going to exec ls, we're gonna swap out the usual standard output file descriptor, which is, zero or is it one? I always forgot it is. I think it's, I think it's one. Anyway, uh, we're going to replace that file descriptor with the file descriptor for the open file foo, which we're going to write to such that when we exec the LS program, it has the file foo as its standard output. And so the, the, the command output doesn't go out to the terminal. It instead goes out to this file foo. And because we didn't run this command in the background, uh, the shell itself is actually waiting for the ls fork to return to give an exit code, uh, and then it will uh, collect its um, uh, the the finished child process and then continue on its way. And I think I've even left out some details, but that alone, what I've just described, that's an extremely complicated story. And you could say, well, sure, as just a casual user of the command line, you don't have to use that. But the problem with uh, the Unix environment and, and really just all of our software is that inevitably you're going to hit that point where you do have to know all these moving parts because there's going to be something you just don't understand about why something is going wrong until you understand that whole complete story. And so I think it's very important we ask the question, does the story really need to be that complicated? And I say, no, it does not. And beyond even just the complexity of all that, almost all the particulars feel like this giant kludge where uh, just in like the naming conventions make no sense to any newcomer. It's just this, this this jumble of names that has been piled up over decades. And sure, there, there's a lot of people out there very comfortable with all these and familiar with all these names. But if you're not familiar with all these names, they just don't make any sense. They're, the naming's all strange. There are inconsistent conventions for both the naming and syntax of command parameters. And the standard Unix shell and all its variants, whether bash or dash or zsh or just all the variants, they're all really terrible. They, they're just really bad variants of dynamic languages. Over decades, they've just piled on all these convenience notation features, which can save experts uh, a few keystrokes, but are just not worth it in the grand scheme of things. They just put a huge burden on everyone else. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say we'd be better off just having a commonly used dynamic language, whether Python or Ruby or JavaScript, even who cares, as the, the standard shell language. Even though it'd be more verbose to run commands, you'd just run functions and, and say like run, and the first argument is the name of the program you want to run, and then a string for all the remaining arguments. That would be better, that because you'd have a simple, consistent language, relatively simple, uh, notationally language. The shell languages are just these cobbled together messes of ad hoc conveniences. Which is why Perl, for example, is a shitty dynamic language that no one uses anymore because it takes all its influence from the shells. It was a worthy experiment at the time, but we learned better, and the better dynamic languages that have survived uh, move away from that direction. I should be clear, though, that simply replacing the shell language with something more sensible and somehow removing that layer of legacy cruft, which is the, the whole terminal concept, that all would be an improvement, but it wouldn't really solve the root problem, which is all that inherent complexity I described in what's going on behind initiating a process behind a simple command like ls hyphen la. And also be clear that all that complexity really just can't be sidestepped. It's really kind of tethered together with the heart of uh, most Linux distributions where everything is uh, glued together with a bunch of shell scripts. That situation has kind of improved over the years because like systemd came in and replaced a whole bunch of old uh, startup scripts, but there are still many places in Linux systems where you really just can't avoid the shell. It's, it's just tied up with the whole thing. It's, it's essential glue that makes the thing go. And of course, if anything goes wrong on your system and you want to fix it and you investigate internet forums to find the answer, the answers you're going to get are almost always going to be in the form of some kind of shell business that you're going to have to deal with. Okay, so the shell and terminals suck. What else sucks? 
dependency management. Package managers are in concept a very good idea. It's just that, well, sure, very often software I install with a package manager does work very often, but very often it doesn't. And the question is, well, why? Aren't these systems supposed to solve all those problems? If a piece of software works on one person's machine, on the developer's machine, let's say, why is it such a headache to get it working on other people's machines? If you used a PC in the DOS era, you may remember that it used to be as simple as simply just copying all the files of a program into a directory on the target system, and then it should work on that system, assuming it works on other systems with the same version of DOS. Barring, of course, issues with the low memory barrier and hardware support, but what we didn't deal with back in those days is one installed program messing up another because they have conflicting dependencies. If the package managers manage dependencies simply by ensuring that all the static pieces are there on your system that are needed, then package management should work brilliantly. But they do more than that, that's the problem. They also, when they install many packages, they end up running scripts and other programmatic code that actually manipulates stuff, that reaches in and modifies parts of the system, that mucks with configuration. And that's where everything goes wrong. In other words, these package managers, yes, do a reasonable job of ensuring that all the packages that you think should be on the system are actually there, but then what it doesn't do is actually verify that those packages are in their virgin state, because the way we write our software is you end up just recklessly mucking with the state of all of our pieces, all of our packages. So of course the package managers can't give real assurances because they don't really track all possible configurations of these packages, they just track the packages themselves. But of course, in many cases, whether or not your software is actually working hinges on the configuration state. I think what's really terrible about these sort of software failures is that they're not really considered bugs. Uh, these software packages are written to certain expectations about their running environment. And when that environment doesn't meet those expectations, the authors of those programs don't really treat that as a bug. They just say, oh, you need to fix your environment. We have this tangled system where the pieces are supposed to work together or at least live side by side peacefully. But there are many, many scenarios where no one's really in charge or feels responsible for when the pieces don't really fit together and don't really cohabitate well. So how could we fix this? Well, I think first off, you need to have a much stricter notion of package management where there are strong guarantees that separate packages can't really mess with each other. And also that packages can't really get into states where suddenly they aren't really the package expected by other packages. If, if A depends upon B, B really shouldn't be able to get into any state where it doesn't suffice what A expects. So how do we ensure that? Well, I think part of it is at least just having higher standards for our software in terms of how much configuration we deem reasonable for a program to have. But aside from just having higher standards, we could also, I think, minimize configuration state if we recognize that uh, most configuration, a huge, huge chunk of it, concerns just two things. It's about resolving references of just hooking up A is supposed to uh, find B, and then there are other huge half of configurations all about security, it's about permissions. Those two things right there, resolving references and permissions, I think describe probably the root of 80% plus, even 90% plus of all the stupid problems I've had to deal with on my computer. Things like, oh, that thing that's supposed to be in that directory wasn't in there or was misnamed or whatever, or had the wrong permissions, all that sort of garbage. So if you could somehow get rid of all or at least most of this configuration state concerning resolving references and permissions, you would be eliminating, I think, the primary cause of stupid errors. Okay, so now the question is, what would a system look like that solved all these problems or at least mitigated them? Well, first I'm gonna do a broad overview of my proposal before going into the details. So first off, for package management to really make sense, I think it actually has to be something done at the kernel level. There is a kernel level notion of what packages are on the system. Bear with me, I know it sounds strange, but I think the rationale will be uh, evident fairly soon. So within the system, all packages, meaning mainly all programs, but also all shared libraries, and then also all files and all directories, all the things basically that the kernel identifies are known by both a UUID and then also hash IDs with the idea that the UUID identifies something through all of its versions, whereas the hash ID uh, both verifies cryptographically that this is what we say it is, and also it identifies the version. And the idea of these IDs is they really should be machine independent. They're not just some artifact of one particular system. When you copy a file around, when you uh, distribute a package, the, you, these IDs are really gonna be the same on every single system. 
And so when we resolve references in configuration in the system, it's all through these IDs. What we're getting away from is hooking up references to the reference in the form of file paths. That's extremely error prone. That's a huge source of all of our headaches. That's what we don't want to do. Unlike file paths, these IDs are going to be the same on every single system. Now, of course, there are details here. Well, how can you enforce UUIDs being uniform across all systems? You can't really do that. Um, but I think as a matter of all practical purposes, it'll work well enough for reasons I won't get into quite yet. Now, conventionally, directories on Unix and all systems like Windows, uh, they're a listing of names mapped to actual uh, behind-the-scenes file IDs. So in a sense, conventionally, directories are actually what give files their names. And you can have hard links, so-called, uh, to the same file in, from multiple directories, but then they'd have different names in different directories. That's not how things work in this system. In this system, each file and directory has a set of metadata, optional metadata attributes associated with them, including possibly a name, uh, but also things like the creation date and whatever else you want. But all of those things, including any name, in fact, are all optional. You don't have to give your files or directories names. They can just exist because the true name of anything is really just its set of IDs. The idea here is that we want to move away from any sort of conventional file hierarchy. There's no notion of root directories. There's uh, no notion of mounting partitions, any of that sort of business. It's just you have a bunch of files and directories known by their IDs. And rather than thinking in terms of browsing up and down uh, neatly organized hierarchies, because in actual fact, they're never really neatly organized. Instead of even attempting that, what we're really doing is just relying on search, search of the metadata of the files and directories. So as I mentioned, we want to make the security system as reductively simple as possible. And so we actually really only have two privilege levels. There's no real concept of user account privileges per se. It's just every program running has either admin privileges or non-admin privileges, or maybe you call them super, I don't know, maybe they'll just be called super user privileges or whatever. Now also understand there's no process hierarchy. There's just uh, your installed packages and programs uh, when installed are given admin privileges or not. And so when an installed program runs and it has admin privileges, it then can do certain things like in fact, install and remove packages on the system. That's one of the privileges. So each installed program, each installed package and each user account, including whatever we call the admin account, whether it's super user or whatever, all of these things have their own individual file space. And the rule is that admin programs can see anything on the system. They can do anything they want, of course, uh, but normal programs can only access their own file space and the non-admin user account spaces. And, and understand, there's, there is a notion of a logged in user, but there's no process hierarchy, right? So when a user program, a non-admin program is running, it can see actually all of the user accounts, whether those people are all logged in or not. We're not trying to really protect the, the normal users of the system from each other, because I think in modern computing, that just doesn't make any sense. It's, it's an out of date notion. It, it, it certainly made sense back in like the, the, the seventies when you had a bunch of people logging in through terminals. And of course you want to actually protect those users from each other because there are a bunch of strangers all sharing the same machine. I don't think it, it just doesn't happen anymore that strangers are really sharing the same machine. And sure, you have people like spouses sharing the same laptop and so forth. But the notion that we're really going to keep the uh, one person's files on the machine secure and truly private from the other user of the machine, just it, it's a total fanciful notion because one of those people is going to have admin access, right? So it just it becomes totally meaningless, this barrier between users messing with each other. Now, when it comes to IPC, inter-process communication, there really should be one primary mechanism, like the default way of initiating all sort of contact between programs. And what that should be is something like a request response mechanism. Any program can send any request to any other program and that program then comes back with a response. To my understanding, what I'm describing is actually quite like what KDBus is going to be on Linux, uh, though I think that is complicated by all concerns about the conventional Unix permission system, but we're dispensing with all that, so it's a much simpler model here. Do understand, though, the implication here is that each program effectively, in some sense, has to be like a server. It has to listen for requests and respond to them, sort of like the way that Windows programs always have to have this message pump going. Now, what requests a program will respond to is entirely up to that program. It's just a matter of each program's external public API. 
For many programs, the set of requests it responds to is going to be very simple. Like a lot of user-facing software, like a game, for example, there's not much it really needs to do when, in relation to other programs. It just needs to be started, uh, maybe paused, and maybe stopped. So that might like be a good bare minimum that every program would implement. Because understand, in the system, we're trying to minimize as much configuration state as possible. And what programs happen to be running at the moment, that itself is configuration. And so it's a source of error where you try to talk to that program, but oh wait, it's not running. And so the idea here is that with this IPC mechanism of request and response, a program should be in the state of ready to rec uh, respond to these requests at any time. Now maybe the program is dormant, or maybe it was never loaded into memory and started executing at all. But the idea is that the kernel, when your program receives any sort of request, then it spins up and it should then be ready to give a response. So again, there's no process hierarchy here. There's no programs managing other programs, really. As much as possible, each program to external appearances should be this stateless, always available thing. It should be more like a service, basically. Now, this request and response mechanism is a good baseline for meeting most common needs of communication. But then, of course, there are special cases where you have a lot of data you want to send back and forth. And so this request response may not be uh, uh, most suitable. So between processes through this request response mechanism, uh, we can share handles to things like files, pipes, and uh, chunks of shared memory. And that way you can have higher performance uh, mechanisms for IPC. But understand the general pattern here is everything is initiated through this request response. I'm not totally certain about some of the details here, like when you hand off a handle to a file to another program, should you have to then also do some kind of system call that validates that file handle so that it uh, gives that other program permission? Because maybe, the, maybe these file handles that you share between programs, maybe they're actually system-wide uh, IDs instead of uh, process-specific ones. So there, there are details like that. I haven't totally worked out, of course. And lastly, again, we're trying to minimize as much configuration here as possible, but there's going to be some legitimate amount of configuration that our programs are going to need. So where should we put it? A traditional Unix answer is that, hey, we'll have this uh, Etsy directory and a bunch of uh, well-known uh, file paths to certain config files there. That's really error prone because you have a bunch of different programs all mucking with the same state there, the same configuration. Um, the, all sorts of other conventions for storing configuration and files. Now, I'm not positive about this, but I suspect it actually is a better system to have a central registry. The problem, I think, with the Windows registry is it has a complicated permission system. It also uh, is kind of reckless in terms of what programs can modify what part of the registry. Uh, and then a whole lot of programs uh, totally abuse the registry because it, uh, they, they're they not really storing config in the registry so much as they're storing data. That it's, it's being abused as sort of this uh, general purpose IPC mechanism instead of, of really a, a place to store config. So the registry I have in mind, the idea is it would just be a um, freeform storage of key value pairs. But every user account, uh, including the admin account, and then every program should have its own separate namespace for these key value pairs. And of course, non-admin programs could only touch their own namespace and not the namespace of other programs. As for touching the user account namespaces, I'm thinking maybe only admin programs should be able to touch that stuff. Like, do you want regular programs to fight over what your language setting is or what your user preference for mouse speed is? I'm not sure that's something that should be possible. Maybe, maybe the non-admin programs can read user account preferences, but they can't modify them. Maybe even something more complicated than that. I'm not certain. It might also be best if perhaps there were a separate namespace for every pairing of a user account and a program so that when a program stores settings that might affect the currently logged in user, they would have one place to store it that's separate from uh, where they would store settings for other uh, users. That might be a thing. I'm not certain. Maybe there's a simpler solution to that. Uh, this whole registry business is probably what I'm least confident about. I... <laughs> I know the Windows registry has become a huge mess. Uh, I'm not exactly certain why though. And perhaps if we just avoid the extra complications they introduced and it would turn out fine. It's, it's an open question. So now consider how much the system I just described, consider how much it simplifies. We're getting rid of any notion of a process hierarchy. So there's no real fork executing. There's no environment variables, thank God. 
You don't have the file handles which a child inherits from its parent process, so there's no notion of standard and stand out. There's uh, no inherited permissions or anything like that. There's no exit codes, no program arguments, none of that. We're also getting rid of, or I guess you could say radically simplifying the user and file permission system. There's no notion of groups. There's really no file ownership per se. Uh, there's no exec bit. There's no mounting of partitions. Uh, none of that stuff. And as I mentioned at the start, we're also ditching basically everything about terminals and shells. So there's no sessions. There's no job control, you know, foreground versus background. There's uh, no crappy languages, only really proper programming languages that are meant for general purpose work. And that brings me to the question of, well, okay, if we're ditching terminals and shells, what does the replacement look like? Well, first off, uh, you don't really need a terminal to have an interactive prompt. You could just do, say, well, like what uh, the JavaScript console in the browsers does, where you, you're presented with a prompt, and then you get back the response, just like you would for an interactive session of a dynamic language at the terminal. So whatever language you use for your command prompt, that language itself would provide its own interactive command prompt. These command prompts, however, would have a call response format. They would be like a terminal where it's this basically this stream of text input and string of text output um, that actually can be written to and read from uh, in an interleaved fashion by different processes. We, we don't want that at all. We just want the shell itself presents the user with a command prompt and then they enter something and they get back a response and that response is displayed in a self-contained text area. It doesn't just constantly stream and interleave with whatever comes after. If you follow that terminal model, then you have to introduce all sorts of complications to deal with questions like, well, this process is running in the background, but we don't want it to actually spit stuff out to the standard output. So we have this notion of sessions and so forth. And, and just we, we want to sidestep all of that. So no, it's just call response, call response, uh, like you would see, uh, as I mentioned, in the JavaScript console and in the browsers. Now, <laughs> for certain commands that you issue, you want uh, to get back a streaming uh, response like maybe it's just this ongoing updated log that you're seeing the output of so the idea then is that in the response area it would have this scroll a response doesn't have to be this static thing it can be this live uh, constantly updating view of data being streamed in from the request that was made so for example if the command you issue uh, sends an IPC request to some other program uh, perhaps it expects back as a response a file handle and then your command prompt, your shell, as we, whatever you want to call it, takes that file handle and then constantly reads from it and then updates uh, the response to that command. But understand the scroll of your shell itself uh, always shows the commands and the responses one after the other, not interleaved as it might happen in the terminal. I also think it would be really nice if that when you're typing your commands, you could have all the full features of a proper text editing environment. It's just really obnoxious how like say the standard cut and paste shortcut keys don't work in terminals because of legacy reasons basically. That's just really, really terrible. So in fact, uh, depending on the shell language, but in what I have in mind, you very often would want to format uh, whatever code you want to execute across multiple lines. So you want to use enter key and not have it actually execute the command. So I think actually shift enter or maybe control enter should be what you do to actually execute the command. If you just hit enter, it should take you down to the next line as what normally happens when you're writing text. So whatever the show language looks like exactly, one thing you're gonna to wanna to do a lot is issue requests to various processes on the system, various programs. And so to make that happen, uh, basically what you want is for your shell to provide some standard library functions for making such IPC requests. Lastly, one thing I would really like to see modernized about the uh, command line experience is just the output should be much prettier. It should be readable in a way that output of traditional commands and you know traditional uh, logging to terminal just isn't uh, because terminals come from this earlier archaic era with you know no real notion of text formatting. So I think the solution is that uh, many responses in the shell should actually display HTML output or, or, you know, I don't like HTML. I have all sorts of issues with it, but something like HTML at least. Some sort of response that is formatted text and having HTML or something like it would actually also be a way to imitate um, the, the behavior of uh, a lot of terminal programs these days where it's actually it's sort of interactive where you issue one command, but then it prompts you for the next step 
well, if the response that comes back in our shell has HTML with some kind of form, then like you can click on it or use keyboard uh, input or whatever to then submit another command. And so you could get a very similar effect, like maybe some sort of command uh, ha wants you to hit yes, no. Like, are you sure, really sure you wanna do this? And so in the response, it could present a form uh, with a button yes and a button no, and you type Y or N or, or you click on the button and it submits the command again, this time saying, yeah, I re I'm really sure. And you could do other interesting things like uh, present a table or a list where you can click on various elements to get more information, or maybe as a convenient way to execute a command on some element of the list. You could do all sorts of stuff, but of course, past a certain limit, you probably should just uh, start writing a, an actual proper interactive program if that's what you really want. Okay, I hope that gives you some idea of how we could have a command line environment that's more modernized and also ditches a lot of uh, legacy complications of the traditional uh, terminals and shells. Uh, another big remaining question you might have though is, well, what would development look like on this system? Because uh, as I mentioned, for a program to run on the system, it really has to be an installed package. And so what that implies then is we're gonna want to, in the course of development, have an easy way of installing a sort of temporary package. And so I think what we'll need is to reserve half the, uh, the, the address space, the ID space uh, of our packages for private use so that when doing development, you can choose just a temporary ID for your program just so you can run it on your own local system. But then of course, when you want to actually publish your program, then you're gonna to want to use a public ID. So anyway, you're developing a program, you have all these uh, source files that you then compile into a running program or whatever the process is with your language and you wanna actually then install that, well, you're gonna need uh, what we might call a manifest file that's gonna describe your package and its dependencies and understand that we consider the target system API and API, ABI combos as uh, part of the dependencies here because we wanna make sure that when you install a package that it's targeting the correct platform. And then with that manifest file and then also probably just a single directory that lists all the files uh, that need to be part of the package, there's some sort of system call that takes that uh, specified directory and manifest file and installs that as a package. And then you have your program installed as a package to which you can issue uh, IPC requests and thereby kick off the execution of the program. I suppose you could argue this sounds more roundabout than the conventional way of just compiling your executable and then running it. Though of course even that's not so simple because you have to set the exec bit before you can run the file. And of course, if what I described is more complicated, well, of course, you could just automate it as part of your build process. Probably not a big deal. You may still be wondering, though, what about the case of dynamic languages or, or rather languages with runtimes where you don't necessarily have a binary executable? Uh, how does that work? Well, conventionally, what we do is we invoke the, say, the Python interpreter and as argument, we pass in the, the name of the, the script file that is the, the kickoff for our program. Well, what we could do instead is we could have a small binary, which doesn't have like the full runtime, but it drags in the bulk of the runtime from a shared library. And this way you could take your Python script or your whatever dynamic language script and package it up into something that fits in basically the same package mold of natively compiled programs. And whatever the details and complications here, I just think it's really important that whatever we do, we need to arrive at some solution where every language isn't inventing its own package management system on top of the system-wide package managers we're supposed to already been using. If our system package manager doesn't accommodate all of the things we want to install in the system, then I think we've failed because then for these special cases, we'll be dragging in extra complexity, which is exactly the sort of thing that's so terrible about the systems we have already. So I hope now you have some notion of what using the system might look like. I'll end here by addressing just a few miscellaneous uh, lingering questions. Uh, first off, what about network sockets? The problem with network sockets is that they effectively represent a kind of configuration state. And you have all, all these different programs that you might want to install in the same system, and there's potential there for conflict because they might want to use the same, the same ports. And what we can't seem to do is just resolve these conflicts as they come up on the system automatically because external programs, stuff on other systems, is, is expecting uh, certain programs in our system to run at certain ports. So I have some notion of how this problem might be addressed. You could basically have the system 
uh, automatically assign ports rather than letting programs choose which ports they want to use and therefore the, pro the system can ensure no two programs are using the same ports. Uh, and then you could have running on a well-known port a lookup service that tells other systems when they want to know, hey, what, what port is that program running on? It can tell them. So for example, another system asks, hey, the program with such and such public UUID, what port is it using? This would be a workable solution, perhaps, though it does introduce a little overhead in having to look up these ports. But of course, probably the bigger flaw is that it presumes that every system in the world has some notion of the packages I described, which of course will not be the case. Another question that comes up is, well, what about plugins and modular programs? How exactly do they fit into the package system? Because I think what we don't want is for this package to be installed, but then to bring in all these plugins or modules, and, and then the package has this totally different configuration state than what it started with. In fact, more than that, it's not just more configuration, it's more code. And so this program, which was understood to be one thing when it was installed, is now something quite different. And that violates the whole spirit of this package management system. As much as possible, we want the installed things on our systems to be just what they say they are, and not something else. I suspect the solution here is simply that any plugin or module to a program gets installed as an extra package, and then the existing program that depends upon this new plugin or module, its manifest uh, describing its dependencies gets updated with this new module. I think something that simple may actually be a workable solution. Another question people might ask is what I described like plan nine which wouldn't be a favorable comparison because Plan 9 was a total failure. It didn't replace Unix at all. There are a few ways in which what I described sounds a little bit like Plan 9, um, like actually getting away from conventional hierarchical file systems. That was sort of an idea in Plan 9. But I don't think there's actually major overlap because actually what Plan 9 was really all about it was an attempt to take Unix and somehow make it network transparent. Uh, to do some sort of uh, re rethink of the system that made it somehow supposedly more suitable for networking. I think ultimately Plan 9 failed because that vision didn't really coalesce. It, it wasn't really clear if it was any benefit uh, to be network transparent in that way. I, I think network transparency like that may actually really just be a mistake. I think what we want out of, out of our platforms is to take care of the local system and then let all networking concerns really should be handled at the application level. In fact, in a way, Unix itself, I think, suffers from thinking too much about the networked environment because, you know, originally it was developed for many computers with a bunch of terminals. And so already it, it was designed to accommodate a sort of networking. And so it brought in this complicated notion of uh, user permissions and process hierarchy permissions and all that stuff, which I want to get rid of. So I would understand people making a comparison with Plan 9, but I think actually my system goes really in the other direction, going back towards a network agnostic platform. The last question I've been thinking about is, well, how do we implement the system? So ideally, of course, as I described, I think at the start, is that you would take, say, the Linux kernel and you'd modify it to present a different set of user land abstractions. That, of course, would involve a lot of work uh, and require a lot of expertise that I don't have. I know I'm not a kernel hacker. I'm sure it would be interesting work and I, I'd like to see it done eventually, but I think the, the shortcut to getting such a system as I described up and running, at least as a proof of concept, is to do what's called application virtualization. This is basically what things like uh, the so-called containers like Docker have done, where it's not hardware virtualization. We're not embedding an operating system uh, within another operating system. It's just we're presenting an abstracted environment for programs to run in. So the thought is I could define a set of APIs such that programs written to this API uh, could run within a, a sort of abstracted environment within Linux, but with all the appearances of uh, the system I described. So for example, instead of using normal system calls for dealing with files, uh, you would use the ones provided by my API, and then you would be working with files in the manner as uh, my system prescribes. Now, I imagine such an implementation would not be ideal in certain ways, like for example, the whole uh, request response IPC mechanism. Uh, I don't know exactly how I might implement that within Linux in user land terms, uh, but it could be done probably though with overhead 
uh, relative to what you would get if it were properly implemented at the kernel level. So this implementation wouldn't be ideal in terms of performance, though it probably wouldn't really be all that bad either. And I imagine there's something in the security model that uh, couldn't be enforced properly. Uh, so it may not provide the, the proper security guarantees uh, that a real implementation of the system would. Still, despite all these drawbacks, I think that actually would be the way to proceed, certainly as a, as a means of getting a proof of concept of the whole system out there, um, but also to, to work out kinks in terms of certain issues and use cases, which I'm certain I have not properly accounted for. So in fact, if you have any thoughts about how the system I described won't work in some key way or has some major issue and perhaps you can propose some solution, uh, I'd really like to hear that sort of thing. And I hope that uh, maybe if you didn't agree with everything I said, you at least uh, are starting to think about how our platforms could be better, how they could be greatly simplified and cause us less pain.